Uh, what I'm going to do in the next few minutes um, is just give an overview of, uh, of where I think the state of multiparametric MR is today. Uh, we'll hear a lot more detail about specifics, I think, through the rest of the conference. Um, so I think if I was to summarize the three major issues that the imaging community wants to address uh, with um, our colleagues in other specialties, it's quality control. Uh, and that's both in technique and interpretation, and how do we ensure that this uh, is something that um, rolls out into the community and, and is done properly. Um, the second one is uh, one that relates to cost and efficiency is, uh, and to some extent safety, is do we, are we okay doing biparametric MR? In other words, not giving a contrast injection, and this is already gaining adoption uh, based on some of the um, trials done so far, comparing it to um, uh, triparametric or MR with contrast injection. And I think the most important one, um, and the one that is of vital importance, is uh, really understanding what is essentially a new pathway in prostate cancer care, and what is going to be disruptive in early prostate cancer, which is the interjection of MR and all the risk profiling and surveillance and follow-up of patients. Uh, before we have uh, good risk profiling models that include MR, and how are we going to handle this as we move forward, and should we have consensus on some basic approaches to this instead of a free-for-all? So I think these are the three major areas um, that certainly um, uh, we want to look at. So if we look at indications for MR, we will see in guidelines uh, in various countries all of these indications approved. Um, Two to, two to six, I think, are fairly well accepted, um, to, uh, but to varying degrees practiced. Uh, but I think the high PSA, no prior biopsy one, is the one that has had variable adoption and potentially the biggest impact on resource and, and care. Um, and, and that's what I'm going to focus on in the next few slides. So there's been three major trials that I think most people here are familiar with that know about MR. Uh, the precision trial, the 4M trial, and the MRI first trial all completed in 2018 and published in 2018-19, all multicenter prospective trials, all basically showing um, that in the setting of the biopsy-naive patient um, with an elevated PSA that um, really the, the primary value of MR falls into two, into, in two, two things. One is biopsy avoidance and the other is reduction in detection of clinically insignificant cancer. The hope, or I think the, um, the enthusiasm about MR as a test that was applicable for all cl uh, clinical scenarios to increase target yield and increase detection, I shouldn't say target yield, increase detection of clinically significant cancer did not pan out in all of these trials. So we have to accept that you know, MR, uh, and it's been said this morning already, is not a perfect test and does miss in a small but potentially important subpopulation clinically significant cancer. How are we going to deal with that? Uh, so we need a safety net in the pathway. Um, there needs to be some concept, and, and when I talk about surveillance, I don't mean specifically active surveillance. I mean surveillance in the sense of a safety net for patients who are avoiding biopsy because of a negative MR. Um, so if we look at the sort of strength of evidence uh, for MR in, in the publications, we can rank them like this. At number one, we're seeing reducing a reduction in the number of patients being biopsied with the introduction of MR. We're seeing reduce, a reduction in the diagnosis of insignificant cancer, uh, reduction in the biopsy cores per patient, particularly if you are uh, in, a, in an individual patient, if you do targeted only, but, and then in an overall population, uh, if you look at, include the biopsy avoidance. And then the, the evidence for the other things is pretty weak, that, uh, you know, that we are going to see increased detection, there's conflicting results, uh, and greater precision in index tumor grade and volume determination is also, I think, somewhat uh, weak and um, uh, needs uh, more validation to see if that's really going to hold up and is true. So I come from Canada, I practice in Toronto, and for us the issue of cost containment and public health is very, very real. We cannot unleash these technologies, whether, whether they're new fluidic biomarkers or MR, 
particularly into this space, without really messing up our healthcare system. Um, and so this is just a, a ruling in another case in Canada from one of our Supreme Court justices, basically saying access to a waiting list is not access to health care. So if we introduce an MR guideline that says every man with an elevated PSA should get an MR in Ontario, uh, we're going to have a real problem. Wait lists are going to go through the roof. And so I would say that, you know, in, we, have, we have eight different healthcare systems in Canada. Each province manages its own healthcare system. So the discussions we're having in terms of how to address this is really to start to create formal screening programs like they've done in breast cancer and to really systematize this uh, so that we can collect data and understand optimal utilization. So this is a paper uh, put forward by the PIRAD Steering Committee recently in radiology. And um, uh, I think it, it does a good job. It, uh, Anwar Padani championed this. Uh, and it does a good job of, I think, putting together MR into the current framework. And I think we first start with um, this idea of how do we risk profile patients at the very beginning that we want to put them into this pathway. After we do that, there's a second and I think important step is we don't want to do MRs uh, uh, just out of the gate maybe with elevated PSA. We need to think about MR avoidance just like we need to think about biopsy avoidance. We don't want to create MR anxiety uh, and radiologists are very familiar with this with the patient that comes in with a stack of films in the old days or stack of CDs or digital images of their last 20, you know, uh, fibroid evaluations or something and says, are they bigger, are they smaller? Uh, this, could, this could cause a lot of problems if we do too many unnecessary MRs. So we need a risk profiling strategy for when we do the MR. Uh, then uh, uh, we need to ensure that we have quality and appropriate compliance when the MR is done. Uh, if the MR is um, negative, and we probably need to combine this with a second risk stratifier, whether it's PSA density, whether it's a molecular test of some kind. We need to then say, okay, if the MR is negative, we then put them into this safety net. And what is that safety net? Is going back to the urologist at a certain frequency? What tests are done? Is it serial PSA? This needs to be defined. So this is one scenario. If the MR comes back equivocal or positive, so somewhere between three and five, um, and it's PIRADS compliant, good quality interpretation, we then go on to biopsy, but what type of biopsy should be done? And this is where, again, in this article, there's a preliminary framework discussed for this. Uh, these are all just early proposals. Uh, but you start to ask the question, okay, is it targeted only? Is it a targeted plus systematic? The first biopsy, one I think might argue, should always be targeted plus systematic. Um, and how many samples do you take for each lesion? Is it two? Is it three? Is it uh, probably not more than three, but uh, you know, how many do you take? And what does that do to uh, grade migration? Um, now, if, in fact, you get histology, you have a positive MR, but you get a histology that's not a clinically significant cancer, what do you do? And this is where the pathologists need to give us a little more information than just whether there's cancer there or not. Is there active inflammation there? They need to give us information that we know relates to benign pathologies being positive on MR. And if the MR is positive, you then go on to risk stratified therapy. So in, uh, if the rebiopsy is negative, again, you go back into the safety net. So, you know, given, and I would say that this is true now, is we're getting adoption of MR whether we want it or not uh, across multiple indications. And I think this is, from a radiologist's perspective, I think, uh, uh, a, a way of trying to integrate this. And what you see here is multiple green, uh, multiple sort of uh, light blue squares. And this is where we need risk stratification and decision making that goes beyond just the imaging alone. And I, I think this is perhaps where I would say from an MR centric perspective, one of the big challenges is that, that we, we're facing today. So again, I would refer you to this article and it's just, I think, a well carefully put together thing. Um, so how to biopsy, um, I think we're at about two to three biopsies per target, um, and I won't go through this because I think this is going to be discussed later in the session uh, just for the sake of time. Um, but I think the future, we would all agree, uh, is about more precision in this risk stratification paradigm. 
And one of the issues I want to emphasize, and I think this is important for the machine learning AI component, is that we have three major human touch points that suffer from operator and observer variability right now that are hurting us. We base so much on Gleason scoring, but we know that there's interpathologist, even subspecialty pathologist variability in Gleason scoring. We know that there's variability among the radiologists. All these things have been quantified. One of the nice things about, and we know that there's variability in targeted biopsy skills in the community. And for all of these reasons, we need approaches, and I think we can benefit from machine learning approaches in all of, in all of these areas to get to better precision. So I hope I've highlighted for you, I think, some of the key things focused on MR that will be discussed further and provided some framework um, for discussion.